Hello, everyone. Continuing on our session in lifestyle and healthcare, our next presenter is Dr. Stephanie Sisley. She is the medical director for the Center for Genetic Disorders of Obesity at Texas Children's Hospital. Her professional interests include um, vitamin D regulation, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. She's going to talk to us today about treatment of obesity possibilities for tomorrow. Thank you so much, Dr. Cecily. So just a quick disclosure, um, this will use off-label medications, and I have done some speaking and consulting work for Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. So we're going to talk about what we know, especially regards to treatment with obesity and how that might impact obesity treatment, where we are currently with treatment and where we might be going. So what we know. Uh, the definition of obesity has changed a little bit. So the actual definition hasn't changed. It's still a BMI that's greater than or equal to a 95th percent of the, nine, of the um, 95th percent. But the definition of severe obesity has changed in the last few years. So I'm sure some, all of you now are using these charts. So severe obesity is now considered to be 120th percent of the 95th percentile. And this is uh, close to a BMI of 35 in an adult, so class one obesity. We currently approach diabetes, or sorry, approach obesity like this, right? So it's diet and exercise. That's what we harp on all of our patients for, um, and that's kind of it. Um, and so I just want to um, go over a few more things other than diet and exercise, because most of you, I think, no, weight change is really hard. It's really hard in ourselves if we've tried. It's really hard in our patients. And why is that? If diet and exercise are so great and wonderful, why is it so hard to change? And I think part of it is because it's so much more than just diet and exercise. And so we're going to go through a little bit of uh, this circle. So regarding to diet, um, so this was a study that was done in 2012. Uh, it was a really great study. They basically gave adults, they gave about 100 adults in each group, uh, the book for each of these kind of traditional diets. But they also told them, they, they showed them how to go to farmers markets and how to pick healthy foods. Uh, so this weren't, this wasn't necessarily people doing Adkins diet by, you know, eating bacon all the time. Um, they really in encouraged people to uh, eat healthy. And what you can see is despite the macronutrient composition, so whether it's low carb or actually really high carb, but low fat in every single group, people lost weight. And in every single group, people gained weight. And I think this is really important, not because I'm advocating for our patients to go on diets. Uh, you know, that's not something we typically do in pediatrics, but to understand that the way we are giving dietary and nutrition advice to patients, it may not actually be something that either A, their body responds to well, or B, the way that um, their family can handle it. Right. And they might actually, even though it looks like they're not following our advice, maybe they're just one of these people over here and they just aren't responding well and they need to um, be on a different track. They need to do something a little bit differently. Uh, and so diet is really great. And we know that diet can help lose weight, but diet actually at an individual level may need to be mo modified. Exercise. So another mainstay, right? So in this study, they actually brought people in and they observed the exercise. So this is not reported. They know for a fact that they did this amount of exercise. So this is moderate to vigorous exercise. And what you see is kind of same thing in people who came in and didn't do any exercise at all. Clearly people gain weight, but there's also a bunch of people that lose weight. In people who came in and exercised 200 basically minutes a week of moderate to vigorous activity, there are still people who gained weight. So when our patients come in and say, yes, this is what I'm doing for exercise, they very likely are telling us the truth. Um, and in every single group, these groups don't look that different, right? They look about the same. People lost about the same amount of weight, not exercising at all as they did with exercise. And so I think that's just, it's just really important to know that exercise in and of itself may not result in weight loss. And this, that um, idea was kind of confirmed in a study where they looked at children. And so in children, they did observed exercise for two months, and then they kind of told them, keep what you are doing. So for this period of time, they aren't observing them. And in the group that had observed exercise versus that that didn't, there's no statistically significant difference in weight, whether you exercised or not. So 
Does that mean we don't tell our patients to exercise? Certainly not. Exercise is great. And they should absolutely do exercise, right? There are so many uh, metabolically beneficial as well as just mentally beneficial things about exercise. But I think when people are just looking at it from a weight loss standpoint, it could be really frustrating if you really think you're going out there three, four times a week and doing something and you don't really see the scale differ that much. Now, over the course of time, exercise seems to be really important for weight maintenance. Um, and here you see that at six months, there was some statistically significant difference between the groups, but not at 12. So in kids, right, we say diet and exercise, and we should still continue to say diet and exercise, but there's individual variations on in this. And I think it's really important for us to know um, and for us to give our patients the right um, thoughts going forward as to what, what really this is going to do for you. So monogenetic obesity, so genetic forms that can cause obesity. And I gave a talk on this yesterday, so I won't go too much into this, but our body is really good at maintaining weight. And so there's a bunch of different hormones that actually can go into the brain and they signal and that regulates food intake and energy expenditure. And if any one of these things is not working the way it's supposed to, you're going to get increased hunger and you're going to get increased food intake. And because of that increased obesity. So those kind of rare disorders are well known and we're finding out more and more every single year, but not only uh, genetic forms, but actually epigenetic forms. So this was a study that was done by Rob Waterland, who's at the Children's Nutrition Research Center where I work. Um, and basically they took these mice that tend to be unhealthy and they were pregnant and they fed them regular chow that, you know, is healthy for a mouse. And in their offspring, about three quarters of them look like mom. They're kind of unhealthy. They have extra weight, but a quarter of them actually are lean and in better health. Then they took another group of moms and they just fed them a diet that was rich in methyl donor groups. And so this is just changing diet. And in that group, three quarters of the mice actually are lean and in good health and only one quarter of the mice actually are in poorer health. And so I just bring this up, not to make every woman in the room who has had children feel bad. Uh, that's what I tell Rob every time he gives a talk is that he makes me feel bad as a mom. But to say that the, the kid who's sitting in front of you may actually have things going on in their body that we can't test for. This is not a genetic change. This is methylation of a gene that causes that gene to be expressed or not expressed. And it may actually be something that happened in utero. They might literally be programmed to be in poorer health or in better health. Um, and so there, you might be fighting things in the person in front of you that's really hard to test for and really hard to treat. Um, but clearly, right, we need to do more work in this area. But this is a real phenomenon. And then altered physiology. So there's a lot of different things that can actually impact weight gain. So clearly disease processes, right? We have all seen Cushing's disease and the weight gain that can come from that. There's hypothyroidism, which tends to cause weight gain more in adults than in kids. Um, and then puberty. And this has always been a interest of mine as to why there's some kids that when they hit puberty, right, the weight just skyrockets on and there's others that don't have that effect at all. There's iatrogenic. Sometimes we do this um, because we have to, right? The, the child needs insulin. They need steroids. They need an anticonvulsant. Uh, so there's a lot of meds out there that are known to actually cause weight gain. There's environmental causes. And the data on this is not nearly as clear, um, but it's not surprising to think that something in our environment, whether it's pesticides or plastics or something else might actually cause um, weight gain. Disrupted circadian rhythm. So everyone who's gone through a fellowship and residency and has, a, has had their sleep disrupted um, probably can understand the weight gain that occurs from that. And then there's neuroregulation that occurs after weight gain and weight loss. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit of this data. So this was a program where they did a kind of weight loss meal replacement program for 10 weeks. Patients lost um, about 10 kilograms, over 10 kilograms of weight. And then they kind of did a maintenance treatment. So as during the maintenance treatment, they kind of gained the weight back. Now, what I want you to point out here is at week 10, this is where their weight is the lowest. They've lost, lost weight. This is the blue line here. Ghrelin, your hunger hormone, the only hormone that we have actually that makes you feel hungry goes up. Your weight goes down. Your hunger hormone goes up. Amylin, one of the hormones that actually makes you feel full or makes your weight food intake goes down, this hormone goes down. So when these people have lost weight, their body physiologically is fighting back. Hunger is going up. The hunger hormone ghrelin is going up. The hormones that actually cause weight 
or appetite suppressant are going down. So when patients lose weight and then they say, I feel like I'm starving, they really feel like they're starving. Their body thinks that they're starving. It's trying to get the weight back up. And so understanding this so that we can tell our patients, hey, you're fighting against a real thing here, right? And how do we help you at this stage when you've lost the weight? How do we help you battle this true physiologic process that's going on in your body? In uh, 2016, they looked at the biggest loser competition, right? So these are people who have severe obesity. They lose a ton of weight. So on average, they're losing 60 kilograms of weight over a little over half a year. And then they looked at them six years later. And six years later, most of them have regained weight. Um, several of them have gone back to where they were or a couple of them even higher. Only one person here has lost additional weight. Um, and so six years later, they've regained a lot of the weight, not all of it, but a lot. The resting energy expenditure, when they lost all the weight, the resting energy expenditure goes down. That's not surprising. You weigh less, you burn less. However, six years later, they've gained a lot of the weight back and their resting energy expenditure hasn't changed at all. So you can imagine now if they're in this state and they're trying to lose weight again and their resting energy expenditure is lower than it was before, how much more you have to be in deficit to lose the weight again. And so just really good data to show that when people kind of yo-yo diet and they, they go up and they go down and they go up and they go down, those are physiologic processes that they're fighting against. Um, and hopefully we will eventually be able to kind of come in and intervene for them to be able to help them battle these processes. And then there's a bunch of other influences that have direct and indirect effects and that are really important. Uh, so cultural, mental health, and socioeconomic status, right? So all of this together makes weight control really hard. So where are we with treating this, right? We have um, so many children that are struggling and where are we? So we do have a few therapies that we can intervene with in, in addition to diet and exercise. And so the current consensus guidelines state that you should think about using um, pharmacotherapy if the BMI is greater than or equal to 120% of the 95th, or if they have obesity and a comorbidity. Obviously, they should have tried and failed lifestyle therapies. And I tell all of my patients, none of these drugs are silver bullets, uh, and they will not work if you do not have the drug and exercise piece going on with it. So they, they need to already have this um, going on. And then when to use it long term, you should use it long term if they responded. And the kind of current consensus is if you lost 5% of your BMI after 12 weeks. Um, I will admit, I don't always use this. I think there's, there's times where they seem to be responding. Um, and so I'll keep them on a little bit more, but this is the current consensus. So what do we have? We have loreglutide. Uh, so we've had loreglutide for a little over a year now. And this is the data from adolescents using liraglutide. And so you can see that placebo over the course of <clears throat> a year goes, you know, their weight literally goes up and liraglutide, they actually do lose some weight. They stop the drug, the weight comes back. Um, if you look at relative change, it looks the same. This looks great. Uh, and it's on average a four kilogram loss. But I think this is really important to look at. This is the individual waterfall plot. And what you can see is that half actually under half of the individuals lose 5% or more, which means that under half are responders. About a quarter of them actually lose 10%. So when I'm counseling people, I tell them about half of the people don't actually respond um, with weight loss, or at least what we would consider a response to the drug. Um, in placebo, about uh, just under 20% had that kind of response um, therapy and or response threshold. And then about 8% uh, had a 10% or more. And this just kind of shows what placebo and what lifestyle can do. So if you want to prescribe liraglutide, the information that's currently available is A, it's FDA approved for 12 years and older. It's known for its GI side effects, which is why we titrate the dose. And most of you are probably familiar with prescribing Victoza, so prescribing liraglutide for diabetes. Um, there are some other side effects. Just of note, the only one that's statistically greater in the treated group that's not a GI side effect is dizziness. We titrate the medication just like you do for a diabetes. You titrate it by 0.6 milligrams per week. The difference is the max dose is 3.0 instead of 1.8. And just like um, loreglutide for diabetes, there's the black box warning for C-cell cancer. The other FDA approved medication we have is Orlistat. So the data from Orlistat shows that it's about a 2.3 kilogram loss on average. Um, and again, when the drug comes off, you kind of regain the weight back. 
And the side effects for this um, are the known kind of fatty, oily stools. So of note, 50% have this side effect, 16% have it more than once. Uh, abdominal pain, 22% overall, 6.5% have it more than once. Flattest with discharge, so 20% to 6 And then fecal incontinence can happen in almost 10%. Um, and 2% have that more than once. Uh, the non-GI side effects, headache and upper respiratory infection. That's the end of the drugs that we have uh, available. Well, we do have bariatric surgery available in adolescents. Uh, and so this is three year data. Sleeve and bypass are about the same as far as efficacy. If you look at uh, what it does for comorbidities, there was a really great study a couple of years ago that compared the today study with the teen lab study. So BMI change, teen labs clearly um, has a lot more BMI change uh, than the today study. Uh, and if you look at hemoglobin A1C at baseline, um, there's a little bit more maybe that had normal A1C compared to the today study, but two years in, a significant number of patients have either normal or, and almost all of them are either normal or prediabetes, as opposed to the today study two years later, there's still a significant number of them that have diabetes. So diabetes kind of gets worse, whereas diabetes, the incidence gets better over time uh, with bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgery is a really great option for some people, but just like everything else, there's individual responsiveness. So you have people that lose an insane amount of weight, um, but you also have people that don't respond at all. And these are basically irreversible surgeries. Uh, so they say ruin Y is reversible, but that's a really hard reversible surgery. Uh, and so it's, it's not great for everybody. Plus, obviously, this is only normally typically done in people who have are done growing. Um, and so again, it's not a option for our younger patients. And then just recently, melanotide became available for a very small subset of patients with obesity. So if you have POMC, PCSK1, or leptin receptor variants, um, setmelanotide is FDA approved. You can see that uh, for POMC, there's about a 32 kilogram weight loss average. For those that are less than 18, the BMI Z-score change is negative 1.6. So there's only four of them, um, but that's a pretty good response. Normally in obesity studies, it's considered good if your BMI change is negative 0.5. Um, and leptin receptor, not quite as good, uh, but still 16 kilogram loss and a BMI Z-score change of negative 0.5. Um, and again, there's only three pediatric patients in that study. So semolanotide is FDA approved for age down to age six. If you have a POMC, a PCSK1 or a leptin receptor deficiency, and actually these include the FDA uh, regulations include BUSs. So you don't, it doesn't have to only be a pathogenic. The max dose is three milligrams a day for all ages. The titration dose is a little bit different uh, depending on your age. It is a subcutaneous injection. And just so you know, at this point in time, it's a multi-dose vial. They do not have a pen yet. Um, so it is a, a needle and vial. And then the side effects um, that were presented with the data were almost all of them have injection site reactions and a vast majority of them have hyperpigmentation. This works at the melanocortin receptors in the skin as well. So they do, um, they, they look very tan. And then they, um, there's some kind of typical GI diarrhea, headaches, and uh, nausea. Now, this study was not placebo controlled. So uh, while I can guarantee you that the hyperpigmentation didn't occur, probably wouldn't occur in a placebo, uh, the rest of these might also occur in placebo, um, but this was not a placebo controlled study. So that brings us to the end of FDA approved medications, uh, which is pretty dismal, especially if you're under 12. Uh, there was nothing that I presented that is available to a person who has a non-genetic form of obesity. So hopefully most of you will want to off-road a little bit with me. So on the adult side, there are some approved medications uh, that are not approved in pediatrics. So there's fentramine, there's the fentramine topiramate combination, which is Qsimia, there's naltrexone bupropion, uh, which is Contrave. Lorcasserin was available, however, has been taken off the market in the last two years. For binge eating disorder, listexamphetamine, which is Vyvanse, is approved. And then semaglutide, which is the weekly uh, Ozempic, uh, is approved for adults. Now, um, fentramine topiramate. So this is the adult study, uh, the kind of original study. And so you can see that in adults, about 10% lose or have or the 10% loss in the high dose and about 5% with the low dose um, kind of controlled release groups here. So it's really hard to get Qsimia uh, in pediatrics. Uh, there was actually a study done 
uh, it, Pennington, uh, Daniel Sia, and his group uh, did a short-term study where they looked at 56-day response. And you can see that um, in kids, in adolescents, uh, ventramine topiramate combination causes body weight loss uh, in children as well, uh, whereas placebo kind of gains. Uh, so this was kind of a short-term study. But it's really hard to get uh, Qsimia. It's an expensive medication. Most patients can't really um, afford it. So this is a case report by Claudia Fox and Aaron Kelly in Minnesota. And what you can see here is that this patient kind of does lifestyle, summer hits, they gain some weight. And then over the course of time, they just kind of regain the weight. So they started topiramate, they stopped the weight gain, and then they added fentramine, and then weight loss um, kind of occurs, or BMI loss kind of occurs here. So this would be potentially an option for us is to do these drugs off label um, separately. Topiramate alone in adolescents, so the same group looked at their group uh, of, of patients who were treated with topiramate. And the blue light is kids who only had topiramate and then the black line is who had topiramate and maybe something else, another drug. And you can see that overall over six months, um, there's a trend towards uh, decreasing BMI. And then you can see their individual responsiveness. So some people respond really well and some people don't respond. And then they also did the same where they looked at those, um, they did a study where they actually gave fentramine uh, versus standard of care. So that's what the SOC means. And overall they lost about 3.2 kilograms over six months on average. So that's kind of what the drugs do in and of themselves. Now I'll admit, I trained in, I trained in Ohio and in Ohio, uh, fentramine is really a, not a great drug to use because it, it technically is FDA approved only for short-term obesity, uh, so short-term weight loss. So you can only use it for 12 weeks. And in Ohio, you would actually get your license revoked if you prescribe fentramine for more than 12 weeks. So, um, I guess just my, the way I trained, I've just never used fentramine, uh, because of that. And it was never clear to me in Texas where exactly the, the legality on using fentramine, um, held. So it depends on your state, what your, what your state laws all are on using fentramine. But something similar we have in pediatrics is stimulants. So we have lots of ADHD drugs that work very similar to fentramine. And they are FCA approved down to age six. And we have lots of safety data on them. And most of us have used them in our pediatric practice. Uh, if we, even if we don't use them now, you've probably prescribed them in the past. So from a comfort level and um, from a safety level, we have stimulants. So there was a, a nice study in 2017 where they looked at, they were prescribing the stimulants for ADHD and they titrated based on ADHD response, but they published their data on weight change and BMI change. And so I will say they didn't present statistics in the paper. So I kind of did these stats on my own. Uh, so this is adapted from the paper, but in this study, they used listexamphetamine. They had a flexible dose where they started you at 30 and then based on ADHD symptoms, you could go up to 70 and they landed the mean group, the group had a mean of 50 milligrams. And then they used, um, or methylphenidate, uh, extended release. And they started at 18 and could titrate up to 72. The mean was 45. So this was based on ADHD symptoms, or they had another group where they just forced you to go to the max dose. You know, they, they just had a protocol that increased you up to the max. And what you can see here is that in general, listexamphetamine has a little bit more weight change than methylphenidate, but they both cause weight change. Um, and they both resulted in BMI decreases. Um, and so in general, statistically, it looks like listexamphetamine might outperform methylphenidate, but uh, they both kind of have similar responses. And I will admit I've used both. Um, and I have switched patients from one to the other based on side effects. Uh, and they, you know, have had patients that didn't respond as well or had side effects on one. And when I switched them to the other, the side effects were much better and vice versa. Uh, so I think this can be your comfort level as well as um, the ability of the patient to get the medication. Sometimes insurance companies don't want one versus another. Listexamphetamine is one of the newer ones. Uh, so we can use stimulants. So you could actually use uh, a stimulant off-label. Obviously the issue with stimulants is they're a controlled substance. And so you have to send in the prescription every week. The one thing to think about is combination therapy. Uh, so we're reluctant to do one medication. And even in the adult literature, they're reluctant to do one medication, but these medications work in different areas of the brain. And so like Contrave, naltrexone and bupropion, tends to work more in the frontal cortex and tends to have more, um, of an effect with cravings versus like liraglutide or fentramine topiramate, which 
can work in the hypothalamus area and have more effects on food intake itself, um, as well as, you know, other effects uh, peripherally. And so thinking about the patient in front of you, um, one drug, as I kind of showed before with the fentramine to pyramate, right, that combination, which is now an FDA approved combination, but that combination works well uh, because it's using drugs that are affecting different parts of the brain. Uh, and so for us to think as well, like if we've started one medication, maybe another one on top of it might be helpful. Um, and especially just to know where these drugs work as to know which one might be a good combination to put on top of that. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of really good data on naltrexone for me to show you. So this is one case report. Um, naltrexone is another drug that uh, we can use off-label. Um, this study is looks at a patient who had hypothalamic obesity. And so you can see has surgery. So as you know, right here has the brain tumor, uh, the weight goes up, has surgery, the weight comes down, but then kind of skyrockets again, right after part of the hypothalamus is removed, resulting in hypothalamic obesity. And so they actually start oxytocin, um, which has a little, you know, some effectiveness, but then they add it on naltrexone. And again, you know, they can continue to see increased effectiveness over time using the combination of the two. And there's not a lot of good data, especially uh, for oxytocin with general obesity. There's some data for oxytocin with hypothalamic obesity, uh, but this is just kind of one possibility. Naltrexone is, is one possibility that you also could use off-label. So where might we be going? So in the pipeline is uh, Tessamet. So this is for prader willi and for hypothalamic obesity. Septmelanotide for other genetic forms of obesity. Semaglutide, so the once weekly agonist, is definitely in the pipeline for diabetes and is also for obesity. And then oxytocin for hypothalamic obesity. And then, as I had mentioned before, um, lorcasserone was taken off the market before, but I'm sure there will be other serotonin agonists in the pipeline in the future. So what else is in the pipeline? Well, maybe not drug-wise, uh, but I think treating obesity, as I had mentioned before, it's really complicated, right? There's a lot of things going on with weight gain. And so changing the classification of obesity is probably going to be really important uh, to our ultimate ability to, to treat our individual patients. Because there's a lot of different causes. There's the monogenetic causes, which clearly, if you have a POMC deficiency, you're going to need something different than someone who does not. There's the syndrome related. So if you have Prader-Willi syndrome or Smith-McGinnis syndrome, there's a lot of other things going on in your life and your ability to respond to different therapies. Smith-McGinnis syndrome, for instance, has significant sleep disruptions and therefore they need actually sleep therapy and sleep drugs in order to probably be able to eventually establish a healthy weight. There's timing differences. I feel like it's pretty obvious that if you develop obesity at age seven versus developing it at 57, there's probably something physiologically different going on there. There's metabolic effects, right? So the person who has a BMI that's 60 and yet doesn't have any problems at all with diabetes or lipids or anything, right? Versus the person who has a BMI of 29 and yet has diabetes and hyperlipidemia and blood pressure, right? Different metabolic effects, which means that there's different probably causes of the obesity and also different results of the obesity. Body distribution, right? The people who have their, the adipose tissue all centrally versus peripherally, again, different processes and probably needs different treatments. As I mentioned, there's diets. People respond to different diets differently. People respond to drugs differently. And then there's probably environmental causes that need to be addressed. And so all of this together, right, eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to look at someone and say, oh, you fit into this purple dot class, right? And because of that, the way we need to treat you is different than this person over here who's in the yellow dot class. Um, I think that's going to be key to us really being able to get uh, a hold of this obesity epidemic is that we don't give everyone the same exact treatment. A while back, uh, due to my interest in genetic forms of obesity, uh, we started a, the Genetic Disorders of Obesity program. And so for the program, to get in, uh, you have to be at least one, uh, and you have to have, we wanted you to have severe obesity. We couldn't define it as uh, based on the 95th percentile because uh, there's just no way for our referral pattern to do that. So we chose a BMI that's greater than the 97th percentile prior to age five in order to get into the clinic. The clinic, uh, if you are evaluated in the clinic, you see me, uh, as well as uh, a geneticist. So Dr. Claudia Soler started this clinic with me. 
And we're looking at outcomes of genetic testing, as well as some of these patients end up having some pharmacologic therapy. Um, and we're also just looking at um, kind of comorbidities as well. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of this data. So we've seen 82 patients so far. Um, we, there are about 6.7 years on average, and the mean BMI uh, is 163% of the 95th. They are a little bit more female, um, more kind of non-Hispanic, or sorry, Hispanic white, 28% uh, non-Hispanic white, and 13% uh, Hispanic or non-Hispanic black. And about 35% have private insurance. So you can see this is just the 120th percent of the 95th and the 140th percent um, of the 95th. And so they have, a lot of them have severe obesity. And overall, we have found two that were diagnostic. We have a BBS5 and an ALMS1, so Almstrom syndrome. And then we have several that have really intriguing VUSs that are not considered pathogenic, but they really fit the picture of that underlying um, disorder. And then the last thing I'll show you is this, is just that over the course of this, um, of seeing these patients, uh, I just became really interested in how the parents deal with it. And so we found that we did a qualitative study uh, of 19 parents and just kind of asked them, how does having this child who has obesity, severe obesity from an early age affect you as a parent affect your family. And what we found was that these parents are really isolated. And we call this isolation in a sea of experts because they get advice from everybody. They get advice from the medical community, but they also get advice from the schools and from their friends and their family. And uh, random strangers will walk up to them and tell them things. Um, and so, but they're really isolated. They don't know where to turn and things aren't working. And so they face a lot of barriers um, at pretty much every turn. Childhood birthday parties are issues for them. Uh, school is an issue for them. Dinner is an issue for them. They carry all of the burdens. They feel an immense amount of guilt. Um, and they also have a severe burden to try to protect their child, uh, especially their child's um, kind of mental health and psyche. They don't want their child feeling the stigma of obesity. And they really struggle to get their child seen as an individual. Um, and I bring this up just because I'm talking to a group of medical professionals. And what was really clear is that, unfortunately, we're part of the problem. Uh, so while there were, there were definitely doctors who um, were deemed very positive by these patients, a lot of them had really negative things to say about the medical community at all aspects. So pediatricians, pediatric specialists, um, nurses, dietitians, nutritionists, psychologists, across the entire spectrum. Um, they were really seen as it's your fault. Uh, your child has obesity. You just need to try harder. And, and they really wanted their child seen as an individual and for people to think kind of outside the box. And here's just the one quote I'll give you. I'm not a real easily shaken person and I'm not an easily offended person at all. And when we left, I cried because the pediatrician was just so, like the pediatrician just didn't listen. And it was just very frustrating. And so I think one of the things that has to change as we treat obesity is how the medical community interacts with these patients and how we view them as individuals and really try to help them along their path. And so where are we going? Hopefully is to a few future that's focused on the individual at every single level, right? That, that diet, exercise, genetic, physiology, cultural, mental health, socioeconomic status, at every level, we're seeing what the individual, what these different components are to the individual, and we're trying to create a plan for them that helps them at their level. And with that, I will stop and take any questions. Dr. Cisley, this is an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I totally relate with you um, being a pediatric endocrinologist and seeing all these patients. Um, we do have challenges ahead of us, but um, I'm hoping that we could all learn from each other. And this is an excellent presentation. Um, looking at your last slide, um, there are many components to this. And um, I would like to um, ask you if when you develop a system to address each one of this, um, I hope you can share it with us so we can all be effective um, providers to our patients. 
That would be great. If, if I can develop an effective system, I will definitely share it. I did see one um, Q&A uh, that asked, uh, have you had any success getting Texas Medicaid to cover liraglutide for weight loss in patients without diabetes? And are you aware of any active advocacy efforts? And actually, uh, so the first answer is yes, I have had Medicaid cover liraglutide for obesity. Uh, the issue is, is it has to be appealed. Um, and I basically have created a letter and I put the link to the FDA approval for obesity. The issue is when you put in liraglutide, it goes in as Victoza and it automatically gets rejected because the patient doesn't have obesity. So we have to then appeal it and say, no, the patient has obesity and it is an FDA approved um, uh, indication for this. And so we we have had it. It's not 100 percent, though. Um, and so and some of the commercials, so I, I feel like right now I'm probably 50 50 on getting it approved, whether it's commercial or private. Um, and active advocacy efforts. Um, you know, I actually, with Dr. McCann's talk earlier today, I actually was thinking of that myself, but I don't know. I, I guess I kind of just figured in my head they would <laughs> they would eventually catch up, right? Because initially it was just kind of new and they hadn't caught up um, and I, they still don't seem to be catching up. So I'm not, um, but I do think it, it needs to happen. Um, and I would be happy to partner with anybody uh, to actually do some of that advocacy work to help our patients get that medication. Um, and then I see one other chat question, um, as a center for referral for genetic forms of obesity, do you see patients out of state? Yes, they have to come into state. So we can't see them telehealth, uh, but absolutely we can see anybody from any state. Um, as far as a referral thing, that's not an issue If Texas children's, um, there shouldn't be any issue with us seeing them. Cause I know we see patients in general from Alabama and Louisiana and stuff. So, uh, yes, we can definitely see patients out of state. We just can't see them telehealth. Uh, so that's part of the, that's the only catch. And a lot of times with some of my patients, if, especially if I do drug therapy with them, I'll do telehealth appointments so that they don't have to come to the med center, but I can't do that if they're out of state, they have to be inside the state of Texas for that. You see the second question in the chat. Oh, I did not. Uh, what's the second question? Let's see. Sorry, what was the second question? Oh, it was just a comment. You did yep. answer the question. Any other questions? You answered my question I was going to ask about insurance coverage because uh, I do want to use um, liraglutide, but um, couldn't get the insurance to cover it. Yeah, uh, it's definitely an issue. And if anybody, if you want to, my email is my last name, Cicely at bcm.edu. Um, I'm happy to um, share the paragraph I've created. Um, like I said, it doesn't work all the time, but sometimes it has worked. Um, so. <laughs> If you can email that to me, I will take sure. it and I will spread it around. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for letting me talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.